But right now I want to move on to our next speaker. Whether we're talking about an innovation, aquaponics, vertical farming for the future, technologies for the future, or the future, the human beings of the future who are going to do this work, we are talking about the future. Sunny Ramaswamy is all about the future. He was born and educated in India. He came to this country where he went to Rutgers and Harvard. He is now at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And if I were to refer to him as the head of the future for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, that would only be taking a little bit of license. I'll let him take it from here. Please welcome Sunny Ramaswamy. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Frank, uh, for having me here this afternoon. And uh, okay, so uh, I'm going to have 10 minutes here to share with you what the future is all about. And I really appreciate uh, Frank reaching out to me and having me part of this conversation with all of you, particularly the young people that are here, because you are the future of, uh, of humanity, as, as we know. And uh, what I want to frame my comments around in the next few minutes is using four phrases. The first one is population. The second one is proposition. The third are, is transformative approaches. And the fourth one is the charge that I'm going to give you and have you think about and share with the rest of us as well as to what your thinking is as you, after you have listened to what I've got to say as well in the next few minutes. Okay, the first phrase, population. Now we've heard, uh, you know, for actually probably in the last about, uh, starting about five to 10 years ago is when we started hearing about the fact that there is this population time bomb that's ticking away. And today, the 23rd of April, uh, 2015, our population's uh, just about 7.3 billion people on Earth. And as we've heard uh, all day here and, and heard before as well, this population is going to be hitting about 9.5 billion or so. And the reason that it, I'm putting it at 9.5 billion is something else has happened in the meantime. The one country that figured out how to deal with the population challenge, China, had done it starting in the very early 1980s by literally holding a gun to their people's heads. It was the one-child policy that they had. In the ensuing 30 years, because of that one-child policy, China has been able to avoid having 400 million fewer mouths to feed. 400 million. That's like the population of the United States, Canada, Norway, and you might throw in Australia into it as well. So that's the number of mouths they have avoided to have to feed. Now, in December of 2013, they decided that they're going to ease up on the one-child policy. So as you project out over the next 30 years, you might have that other dynamic taking place as well, that China is going to itself add, in addition to its regular population growth, another 400 million people as well. So there's 9.5 billion people that are coming down the pike. What are we going to do about them? The conversation this morning and, and tomorrow, this afternoon and tomorrow, is going to be about the ideas on how to deal with this particular uh, population that's coming down the pike. The second phrase that I talked about, that I want to talk about, is the proposition. The proposition is that we have to feed, provide the shelter, provide the clothing, and oh, by the way, the fuel as well, for this nine plus billion population that's coming down the pike. That's the proposition that all of us have. And we're going to tie our hands behind our backs with that proposition because we're going to throw at us, collectively, humanity, Things such as climate change, increasing urbanization, the diminishing land and water resources, changing incomes and diets. In fact, if you, again, thinking of changing incomes and diets, if you look at China and India and other countries where there's a, there's a burgeoning middle class population as well that is resulting in those, that middle class wanting the same things that you and I want as middle class in America. China has about 300 million middle class people. India has about 300 million uh, middle class people. And then you can add others as well that are coming up. And all of these folks, they want the same number of things that we want, you and I want, which is three television sets, maybe a couple of automobiles in the garage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And oh, by the way, they want to consume more animal protein as well. And a consequence of that sort of a demand for resources is going to be you know, imposing additional challenges in how we figure out how to put food on the table for this population as well. 
So the, so the proposition really is we have to do this, and yet we have our hands tied behind our backs. Oh, by the way, at the end of it all, we also have to ensure that everybody is going to have a positive health outcome out of this as well, that everybody is going to be healthy and normal, not have to deal with type 2 diabetes or cholesterol or cardiovascular disease or whatever else that we've got, the, the, the maladies of today that we've got as well. These are the propositions that we've got that we have to be concerned about as we're thinking about this population coming down the pike. The third phrase are the, is the transformative approaches that we need. These transformative approaches are in the research realm. Is it in the realm of all the omics that we've you know, been investing in, genomics and metabolomics and lipidomics and on and on and on? Or is it in the realm of nanotechnology, in the realm of internet-enabled things? You know, I talk about the internet of agricultural things, and I understand Julie Borlaug, my friend Julie, who's sitting there, she also talked about that particular topic here this morning. Uh, we need transformative approaches, young people coming in, thinking, you know, bringing their critical thinking skills to be able to come up with ways to figure out how to produce food in this diminishing land and water resource constraint and all the other constraints that I was referring to as well. In addition to that, we need what I refer to as 21st century extension. The, the extension piece of it is the translation of knowledge into innovations and solutions and to be delivered to the end users. What sort of things might we ought to have? And again, I want you to think about that as well as you're going to be responding to these questions as well. In addition to that, there's some low-hanging fruit that we've got right now. You know, we talk about the fact that we need to be doubling our food production in the year by the year 2050. And Jason Clay, some of you know Jason Clay with the World Wildlife Fund, he did an analysis a few years ago, and he says, in order to feed that population in the year 2050 with the technology we've got today, we need two more Earths. And then in the same article, he says, oh, by the way, if you want to live like an American, you need four more Earths. That's what he says in that article. And so we have to have all these transformative approaches that we need in being able to produce our crops and livestock and things like that and deal with food safety issues and deal with the health issues and all that. But in addition to that, right now, we've got some low-hanging fruit in the realm of food waste and food loss. The Economic Research Service of the U.S. Department of Agriculture said in an analysis they did and published last year, they say that America, we, lose, we waste 131 billion with a B pounds of food per year. And that translates into 1,200 calories per day per man, woman, and child. Incidentally, for adults, to, serve, to thrive, you need 2,200 calories. But Americans, we consume 3,600 calories, by the way. That means we're basically wasting about half of the caloric needs that we've got. And if you look at the Western world, the, the developed world, and then look at what's happening in the developing world, Ha about half the food is lost before the dinner table in the developing world. About half the food, as you've heard, is lost after the dinner table in the developed world. And we talk about doubling food production. What is it that we can do right now? What sort of enabling, transformative knowledge do we need right now? This can happen right now. Is it behavioral? Is it some other gizmos that we need? These are things that we need to be thinking of as well. Food hacking. You know, people are going around. There's companies called Soylent and uh, others that are developing approaches to hack food itself and coming up with different ways to ma make food uh, easy to access, palatable, and all that. But I heard a little bit of that clip that you showed, uh, Frank, about aquaponics and hydroponics and vertical agriculture and all that. All that's fine and dandy, right? But I tell you what, they're going to be a very small portion of our ability to feed the world. We still need to be doing agriculture as we've known ever since humanity invented agriculture over 10 or 15,000 years ago, which is that horizontal piece of land on which we grow various types of crops, on which we grow various types of nutrients, i.e. fruit and vegetables, on which we grow protein, i.e. livestock animals, and fish and other things as well. We'll absolutely have to continue to have that horizontal farming going on. And the vertical farming, et cetera, are going to be a very, very small part of it, if we're particularly about feeding this big population that's coming down the pike in just a few more years as well. So food hacking is going to be an interesting thing that we're doing. There's a lot of venture capital money that's going into it. But I bet you, at the end of the day, at the end of this day, when you go out to eat dinner at some restaurant, you would like to have maybe a nice T-bone steak, maybe a nice uh, uh, quinoa salad or some such thing. You wouldn't want to be eating something that comes in a, 
in a Slurpee cup and then you suck it all down. I mean, you know, you, you and I don't eat because we want to survive. You and I eat, of course, that's part of it. But we also eat because it's part of our culture. There is a cultural aspect to the food that we consume as well. And that needs to be a very significant part of how we're thinking about feeding this population that's coming down the pike as well that we have to bear in mind. Last but not least in this transformative approaches are the regulations and policies that we need. We set ourselves up to failure in part because we come up with policies and regulations that prevent people that are about providing food and we prevent them from being able to achieve what they need to do. So we have to think of what sorts of regulations and policies do we develop that can allow people to produce the food that we need that can get from point A to point B so we, you and I can indeed uh, thrive as well. So the last phrase that I wanted to share with you as I wrap up with my eight seconds is <laughs> charge. The charge is what are those transformative things that we need, approaches that we need to be developing in the research enterprise, in the regulatory enterprise, in this idea about this 21st century extension of translating knowledge and delivering it as innovations and solutions. That's the charge that I leave you with, and thank you very much for having me here this afternoon. I applaud your sense of the clock, as well as your sense of timing on these important phrases and charges. If you could identify, and this is a, an, an impossible question, but I'll ask it anyway, you know, the big obstacle to feeding the planet, what would you say? The big obstacle to feeding the planet is getting food from where it's being produced to where it's needed. I think the logistical aspects, this is transportation, storage, et cetera, are going to be a critical piece of what we need to be doing as well. I think that's the biggest kicker we've got in our ability to feed the world. And if you think of the one big, I could imagine, the one big leap technologically, behaviorally, politically that would address that and these other projects, what would that be? Uh, how much time do we have to work with uh, folks in that dome building on the other side of the mall there? <laughs> I mean, it really comes Apparently, down to that, right? endless time. Yeah, right. Apparently, it, it, it really comes down to that. That is, the political will to get our act together to provide the sorts of enabling capabilities. You know, in America right now, last summer, we produced bumper crops of several different uh, uh, species. And they ended up being on the ground in part because the Bakken oil fields were producing oil and they were out competing our farmers on getting their unit trains to move their oil down south and our grain stayed on the ground there, literally rotting. And our farmers couldn't get trains to move that stuff. And so these competing interests that we've got, do people want to drive their automobiles or do they want to eat? At the end of the day, I dare say, you know, food is critically important to our survival and driving around may not be. And so it really comes down to the one thing is if we can convince our policymakers on coming up with a way to deal with these competing interests in a, in a thoughtful manner, and not setting us up to failure. If we can do that, we're gonna win this. Krista Hardin was here earlier today and have said, said if anybody in the audience, any students here want to intern with her, or well, not with her, but at USDA, she actually gave them her email. Yep. I'm not gonna ask you to do that. I will do so at the end after we're done. Uh, well, we're about done. Okay. So if people, <laughs> if people want to engage you or come work with you, yep. uh, can they do that and how? Absolutely. We have, I'm gonna add a little bit more if I may, add, so we have literally in the food and ag space today, right now, and there are several uh, you know, of my friends from various companies that are sitting here in the audience as well. There was a study that was done and released at the World Food Prize last year in October. It says to us there's a tenfold disconnect in the number of jobs being created in the food and ag space and the number of graduates that are available right now. Okay, So we have a huge chore ahead of us of making sure that we get young people coming into this enterprise. Okay? With that being said, we're turning over within USDA and other places where natural resources and things are work is done, EPA, et cetera, we're turning over about 30% of the workforce every five years. That means we have a population that's aging and we're turning over, we need young people to come Say in. It ain't so. And it is so. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so we want you to come through. We have all manner of internships that are available. USAjobs.gov is a great place to go. But send me an email, Sonny, S-O-N-N-Y, at nifa, N-I-F-A, dot U-S-D-A dot gov. I promise you I'll try to reply within 24 hours. I do get, I deal with about 300 emails a day. I do reply. 
Usually I'm about 25 hours, so it's not. <laughs> yeah. So send me your emails, and, and I'll try to uh, connect you to the right people at the right places. We also take interns within my agency itself. My agency, by the way, is, as Frank said, we provide funding for research and education. Sonny, fabulous. All right, thank thanks you for so much. Appreciate it. Thank you so much.